this is really more of a discussion than a class. So we take care to call it a sort of discussion because it's a, um, something where we can participate and learn from each other as well as from me as, and mainly from the Buddha himself. So it's a very nice um, opportunity to discuss some of the Buddha's teachings related to social and communal harmony. Bikunis not usually included, but today they are. <laughs> and, uh, and just see how it applies to our life and how we might use this to live in more harmony and community with each other. So we're actually on the very last chapter of the book, which is exciting for me, not only because we've completed something that we set out to do, but because we can move on to some really deep suttas, like the first suttas that the Buddha taught after his enlightenment, um, as we proceed with this group. And today in the room here, who came along with me is Chi and Victoria and Yushan from Singapore, who came over to take some video footage of us in the new place. And I've been pretty much engaged with her all of the day, all of the afternoon. And uh, because of that, please do forgive me if I am not completely on the ball. I invite you to take over and to <laughs> contribute much yourself. And just to say it's wonderful to see Leo here as well. I was talking about you the other day and saying how excited we are to have you and Tabs come back. So it's really, really nice to see you there in your very cosy looking room. And uh, yeah, we're about to start with the sutta. So a little bit darker today, but uh, hopefully I can read it okay. So is it the case that we ended last time or Venerable Pekka ended with this proper use of wealth? Is that right on page um, 176? Yeah, and did you go through most of it or do you want me to recap? Who would like me to recap? Yeah, mm, three, all right. I'm gonna read through it. Um, I have to say it's not the most immediately appealing sort of to me because I don't really know what you do with wealth apart from by monasteries. So, <laughs> but I'll read through it anyway. And uh, you can, you're very welcome to comment. And then we'll get into the next part on social status and no fixed hierarchy of privilege, which I find very interesting and uh, perhaps a little richer as well. So we're on page 176. The proper use of wealth. And this from, is from the Anguttara Nikaya number 541. The Blessed One said to the householder, Anatta Pindika, Householder, what are these five utilizations of wealth? Oh, there are these five utilizations of wealth. What are the five? Number one, here, householder, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of one's arms, earned by the sweat of one's brow, righteous wealth righteously gained, the noble disciple makes himself happy and pleased and, proper and properly maintains themselves in happiness. They make their parents happy and pleased and properly maintain them in happiness. They make their partner and children, their servants, workers and helpers, happy and pleased and properly maintain them in happiness. This is the first utilization of wealth. So you'll notice I'm changing the pronouns to a more gender neutral pronoun so that all of us can relate to this. And uh, I'll continue from there. Again, this is the second one. With wealth acquired by energetic striving, uh, et cetera, right, righteously gained, the noble disciple makes their friends and companions happy and pleased and properly maintains them in happiness. This is the second utilization of wealth. So we have our family, first of all, and all the people that live with us. And then secondly, we have our friends. So we're widening the circle. Again, the wealth acquired by energetic striving, righteously gained, with wealth, sorry, acquired by energetic striving, righteously gained. The noble disciple makes provisions for their wealth against the losses that might arise because of fire or floods, kings or bandits or unloved heirs. They make themselves secure against them. This is the third utilization of wealth. 
which is already interesting to me because this is a noble disciple. So this is somebody who's obviously seen through non-self and has not the same amount of attachment to a sense of me and mine as an ordinary person. And yet still they're making provisions here um, against all the kind of uh, calamities that can strike, including natural disasters, including people who maybe are adversaries, um, even unloved heirs. And we still protect ourselves, we protect our wealth. So this is very interesting. I would imagine that such a person would not do that with a sense of self, but out of compassion for themselves and also for those who gave that wealth, for those who, you know, for the fact that you work hard for it. And hopefully, if you're a noble person, you're going to make use of that wisely. And I think another aspect of that to me that stands out is that you want to prevent people from doing bad. You know, I remember actually a long time ago when I started meditating in Nepal, in one of the retreat centers there, um, I never left my door locked. I never locked my door, right, because it felt so protected and so many good people around, a really wonderful atmosphere. But then my teacher said that actually sometimes it's good to lock your door to prevent other people making bad karma. It's just a different angle on things, you know. And I think if it comes not from fear and not from covetousness, but just from a sense of protecting and maintaining and um, discouraging people doing wrong, then there can be something to that. Um, we have to be very clear with ourselves. I also uh, visited, I probably shouldn't say this, but I have visited some nuns somewhere <laughs> who don't lock their door even when they go away for a few days. And it's perfectly safe to do so. So we have to find our way with this, but I find that quite interesting. And number four, again, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, righteously gained, the noble disciple makes the five oblations to relatives, guests, ancestors, the king and the deities. This is the fourth utilization of wealth. And number five, and I'll read out the whole first part again, because we sometimes lose it when there's a lot of dot, dot, dot. Again, with wealth acquired by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of one's arms, earned by the sweat of one's brow. Ooh, I have to work harder. <laughs> righteous wealth, righteously gained, the noble disciple. Mm -hmm establishes an uplifting offering of arms, an offering that is heavenly, resulting in happiness conducive to heaven, to those ascetics and Brahmins who refrain from intoxication and heedlessness, who are settled in patience and mildness, who tame themselves, calm themselves, and train themselves for Nibbana. This is the fifth utilization of wealth. Oh, that's quite lovely, isn't it? Especially in the end about the joy in giving to those who are working in the Dhamma, who are practicing in the Dhamma. And note that this happens once you've taken care of all those depending on you. You know, that it's a portion of your wealth that goes towards others and towards those who are practicing properly, not just towards anyone. So we use our wisdom there. And we know that that's a beautiful offering. It's a righteous offering if it is heavenly, resulting in happiness conducive to heaven. I think this is really beautiful because just recently, um, a couple of times, someone sent uh, an alms offering via delivery because they couldn't make it in person. And um, it was so abundant, so touching. We got a lot of joy just receiving it and feeling that kindness and magnanimity you know, because they went obviously much further with the offering than they needed to in terms of amount. Um, but the lovely thing was receiving a message back saying how much joy they got and how much it was teaching them about the importance of giving. And that was without even receiving anything tangible in return. You know, they didn't come and talk to us about the Dhamma. They didn't come and see the place. They just felt that happiness, that gladness in their heart to be part of something beautiful. And... Um, I think this is how we can use our wealth, again, not just to benefit others, but also to benefit our practice. You know, it's benefiting those who receive, hopefully, if they practice well and don't just kind of criticize the donor or the food um, or use it, I don't know, in greedy ways. 
but um, it really benefits the giver and this is the point you know when we give we actually receive so I think this is very beautiful and also the description of those ascetics and Brahmins and Brahmins in this case could refer to the a particular caste although it's unlikely because really the way the Buddha usually uses that word is to refer to people actually practicing. And he says the true Brahmin is one who's purified their mind and is radiant like the moon on a cloudless sky, in a cloudless sky. Um, so the Buddha often redefined these terms in ways that were more aligned to the Dhamma and to the purpose of being a Brahmin in the first place. <laughs> So I think that's very beautiful. Those who refrain from intoxication and heedlessness, who are settled in patience and mildness, who tame themselves, calm themselves, and train themselves for Nibbana. So this doesn't mean we only give to our hats, right? Our hats are beyond the training. And uh, Ajahn Brahm sometimes tells this story of how, as a young monk, there wasn't very much good food. But on certain moon days, and especially days like Katino or like Vesak, there'd be a lot of food. And one day, somebody came along with truckloads of food, really delicious curries and sauces and all kinds of flavours that he never usually got. Not just the rotten fish curry that he didn't very much like, but uh, delicious food he could eat. And they came along and then they said, where's Ajahn Chah? And the young monk said, oh, he's, uh, he's in the town today. And you know what happened? The driver turned around and went all the way home. <laughs> and Ajahn Brahm, he wasn't Ajahn then, he was just Brahmavamso. He was so upset. <laughs> and this is a mistake. This is a mistaken understanding of why we give. We don't give for our own brownie points, you know, because it's better kind of bang for your box to give to the enlightened ones. We give to people who are practicing and uh, any one of us, even if we've only just begun on the path, has the seeds of awakening, has the potential to awaken completely, so long as you've heard the teachings and you're sincere in putting them into practice. So um, one of my teachers once said, uh, when you serve others, when you, um, and by serve here, I mean uh, doing Dhamma service on retreats. So there's one role, which is being the, retreatant and there's another role being the server the dhamma server and uh, I used to alternate those roles so that my practice would hopefully develop in a balanced way and she said to me whenever you're serving people on the retreat even if they go to their room and have a chat these are strict going to retreats or if they keep leaving the the dhamma hall to go to the toilet and they don't come back for half an hour she said remember every one of those could be a future stream winner and treat them that way treat them with respect and I think that's so lovely so we encourage people this way and we gladden our heart because we know that we're helping to create future areas and our hands so is there any comments or questions on this or reflections as to how this could apply in your life um, I'm not sure if Venerable Pekka finished the whole sutta last time or if there was more left to say but uh, I thought I'd recap for those who asked and if there's anything further to add from anyone here also, then please go ahead. <clears throat> Three, two, one. And for people on the Zoom, if you don't feel confident enough to speak, because your voice will be recorded, not your picture, just your voice, um, you get my mugshot the whole way through. <laughs> you can also write in the chat. Uh, you're very welcome to do that as well. And I can read out your questions or comments. Okay, so we'll go on to the promised sutta, which I find very lovely. And I didn't check where this is from, but it's from the Majjhima Nikaya number 96. It could be the Veseta Sutta, possibly. You might want to check I got that right. And uh, here it's called No Fixed Hierarchy of Privilege. So this refers to the Buddha breaking down and redefining again, or maybe undermining this idea of caste that was very prevalent in India then as it is today. So here we go. <clears throat> and then the Brahmin Esukari went to the Blessed One and said to him, 
And Brahmins were the highest caste. They were the, like the priesthood caste. So they sort of spoke in Sanskrit, which was an elitist language, put together just for their religious rituals and in a way to be elitist. Um, and you kind of had to go to them to have yourself saved, in a sense, probably a little bit like some religions today. So um, I think it would, of course, get a lot of money through that. So... Master Gautama, that's the Buddha's name. The Brahmins prescribe four levels of service. They prescribe the level of service towards a Brahmin. The level of service towards a Katya, that's the next caste. The level of service towards a Vesa. And the level of service towards a Suddha. The Brahmins prescribe this as the level of service towards a Brahmin. A Brahmin may serve a Brahmin, a Katya may serve a Brahmin, a Vesa may serve a Brahmin, and a Suddha may serve a Brahmin. So everyone can serve them. <laughs> they prescribe this as the level of service towards a Katya. A Katya may serve a Katya, a Vesa may serve a Katya, and a Suddha may serve a Katya. So the same or lower in the Indian uh, understanding here. And then the next one, they prescribe this as the level of service towards a Vesa. A Vesa may serve a Vesa and a Suddha may serve a Vesa. Lastly, they prescribe this as the level of service towards a Suddha. Only a Suddha may serve a Suddha. For who else could serve a Suddha? Very disparaging thing to say. What does Master Gautama say about this? <clears throat> and this is the retort. Well, Brahmin, has all the world authorized the Brahmins to prescribe these four levels of service? And they reply, no, Master Gautama. Suppose, Brahmin, they were to force a cot of meat upon a poor, penniless, destitute person and tell them, good person, you must eat this meat and pay for it. So too, without the consent of those other ascetics and Brahmins, the Brahmins nevertheless prescribe those four levels of service. <laughs> so that's quite a retort isn't it does that make sense so he's saying you know you're just forcing your own opinions and your own kind of um understandings of the way life should be on other people and then you're making them pay for that in other words it's detrimental to them so what a cheek and then the Buddha says, I do not say, but I mean that all are to be served, and nor do I say that none are to be served. For if, when serving someone, one becomes worse and not better because of that service, then I say they should not be served. And if, when serving someone, one becomes better and not worse because of that service, then I say that they should be served. So can you see the turnaround here? It's nothing to do with the person you serve. It's all to do with the qualities you develop whilst doing that service. I find that so beautiful, you know, because there's some myth, even in Buddhism, that it's better karma to help those who are somehow more noble, you know, or even these awful ideas that some people have that people who are poor somehow, it's a result of bad karma or poor intention or laziness, whatever we think. And uh, this really isn't a view that engenders compassion in any way. Whereas here the Buddha is saying, you serve someone because it makes you a better person to do so. You become better when serving that person, then they should be served. And we can see examples of people who help those in less privileged situations or in war-torn situations or you know, homeless people like Mother Teresa who would go out and literally find people on the street that were, you know, um, struggling to survive, you know, maybe with leprosy or um, starvation or grief or loss. And she would actually bring them in and tend to them. And the Buddha too said, you know, if there's a sick person, you should look after them the way you'd look after me. One who should tend to me should tend to them. So no difference there. So he's completely turned this around from something very worldly to something that fosters our inner growth. And uh, there's no mention here at all of the type of person that you serve. 
So this is very interesting. And I'd really love to hear from you about some, maybe some examples here. You know, what kind of situation when serving could you become worse? That's quite interesting. Uh, it could be related to your motivation for that service. It could be to do with your attitude to the one you serve. Maybe you're serving out of pity rather than compassion. Yeah, Or maybe it's someone who's exploiting you, someone who's uh, very demanding or puts you down. Um, or maybe it's a situation where you start to feel resentment in some way. But I'd love to hear. And also, what kind of situation is our service actually serving us? helping us to become a better person what are the right attitudes motivations It'd be very interesting to hear any examples and I'm aware that I've uh, started off with a lot of my own comments so I would really love to open up to anything you'd like to share and that includes this room yeah so we have a question or comment from someone here keep their name quiet just in case they want to be in confidence if you can speak up we can catch it on the mic <clears throat> just uh, give me examples uh, i found it most rewarding to serve when i feel like it's making a difference and it's really needed then you know you almost see the instant response <laughs> maybe that's part of it you see the results there and then mm. Uh, it's really uplifting or sometimes it's needed and you know that this risk we are confident the results are going to be very beneficial so it's just you just feel good already while yeah. you're doing it um and in terms of serving and just my personal bad experience i think it comes as a social worker where we had where you're working very hard but you don't get the uh the recognition from maybe your manager and we just keep giving you more so uh, and we you know you start burning out and mm. not feel protected and it, yeah with that kind of thing that's some times when serving that i felt like oh that's not very nice i can't keep serving if you if you wear me out yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. great yeah I don't know if others can relate to that, but um, that's very true, isn't it? That sometimes we feel good when our serving makes a difference, you know, and it's an obvious difference. And we need support to serve. I mean, I think that's one of the difficulties for social workers, isn't it, from our conversations, and I don't understand it very well, but you don't really have a lot of um, support from kind of mentors or maybe you can have some from colleagues if you're lucky, but yeah. Sounds like there's a lack. I think, I think it's been generational for social work. Right. Really, you know, it just keeps going on like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm coming to Leo. Yeah, Leo, may I ask you to unmute? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I agree with that question but also I think that writes itself a lot within like systemic dynamics of like what if you're socialized to like feel like you should be serving in which case are you actually serving out of like feeling good-hearted or <clears throat> generous or, or or any form of compassion or are you just serving because you're socialized for it and then eventually build up resentment towards having like spent a life serving others when really maybe that wasn't any of your wish and like in which case does it make you better or worse like if you're neutral towards it does it even make you better at all like if I, I don't know I have thoughts on mm. the power dynamics playing in that I think yeah 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 that's a really good question too like it's an exploration, isn't it? We, it doesn't have a simple answer. Mm. Um, yeah, like if we're doing anything purely because we've been socialized to do it, does it have any good effect? Or are we just playing out old patterns? And maybe they're for good or maybe not. And certainly I think if they're not consciously taken, um, they won't produce particularly good karma. They might produce neutral karma at best. And of course, if we don't question at all, it can actually be harmful. 
you know for example people who get um, influenced by teachers and the teacher tells you to do something that's actually ethically wrong but you have so much trust in that teacher or you know the the idea of obedience it sort of outweighs the idea of wisdom um obedience is the quality that's most promoted then uh, you can end up doing some very damaging things and uh, it's a real good question to explore, especially, I suppose, for everyone to a degree, but I think certainly for me being socialised as a female, I was brought up to feel that my role is to give. I think that's sort of been shown in many gender studies, you know, that um, in general, men are socialised to be, to have something to offer just by who they are, and women are more socialised to define ourselves by what we can give or how we can look after others so yeah that can definitely lead to resentment if we're following along that path and we're not getting anything back yeah Shirley I'll ask to unmute Gunther um yeah um I was listening to a talk the other day about the 10 meritorious actions, one of which is service. And it occurred to me that we, in our daily life, I mean, if we live with a family or friends, we're constantly doing little things for them, like making them, maybe making them a cup of tea, maybe, you know, parents, you know, are always looking after their children. We look after each other. And it becomes a bit routine, it becomes a bit of a chore you know, like, you know, one one person cooks the meal and then, you know, maybe the partner will wash up, you know, and you just sort of do it as, it's, it's, it's all, and you get into a bit of a chore with it. But then if you really put the intention of loving kindness, um, compassion and renunciation, because sometimes you don't want to do it, yeah. And then resentment can come in. But when you think, well, this is an opportunity for me to give, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, it, um, you know, and I'm looking after my husband at the moment quite a bit because he's, he's had this knee operation. And it's really brought a lot of joy in sort of, which, and I, I mean, you, you know, you just do it. You just do it because, you know, somebody late is looking after. But it can become a chore and there can be a little bit of, you know, but if you sort of bring this idea of intention in it, it sort of transforms it. Mm. And then I've been thinking about, you know, I'm getting older and maybe I won't be able to give much more. Maybe I'll have to receive. And then thinking, can I receive somebody else's service? Mm. I mean, you you know, I suppose nuns do monks and nuns do that a, a lot. Receiving and actually thinking, yes, I'm giving the, somebody else the opportunity to serve. I mean, I, that would be difficult, mm. um, and it takes some sort of humility. Mm. Uh, but that's what I've been reflecting on, and but I think it's this, it's the intentionality behind it that's really. Um, yeah. And you can, can really contemplate that. And um, I've just found that yeah. nice thing to do. Yeah, wonderful. I think that makes all the difference, actually. And I think part of that that you were just expressing was also um, not just the intentionality, but the understanding why you're doing it. You know, you're understanding it's a good thing to do, but you're understanding why it's a good thing to do. You know, so there's a sense of appropriateness around it or there's a sense of, um, like she was saying, like there's a sense of um, whether it will make a difference. And when you reflect that it will make a difference, then it also brings about a beautiful motivation because you get really inspired, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. And receiving, yeah, that's uh, another way of giving. I think the two eventually become very similar in many ways. But... Uh, for me anyway, socialise to give. I don't know. I'm learning to receive. I'm learning to ask for help. I'm learning to ask for support. You have no choice, you know, in a role like this. Um, and it is. it does undermine some of the self-view that's related to being a giver. Yeah. Yeah. And coming to Leo again. 
Yeah, I find this point super interesting, Shirley. Like, I relate a lot, and I say, I do think, I do think that's where like being mindful of what you're doing is super important. But I think so many people just do things very mindlessly, especially when you're socialized as a woman. You're just socialized to do those things without really thinking about them. And obviously, when you think about them, and you do it with care, all the compassion and all the care, like it, it, it changes entirely the intention of what you're doing, and it, and it gives it so much such a different flavor and weight but it's very easy I think to get into a way of doing things where yeah you that that doesn't that it doesn't matter because you haven't actually examined why or how you're doing things and in which case is it compassionate not to do the thing because that's also being compassionate towards yourself to reflect on why you're doing it and and is that of service to yourself because it is also important to serve the self, I guess. And and to let on the point of like letting yourself be helped as a woman, like I find it so hard even for to ask someone to make me tea when I'm ill is like already difficult. And like some people are just raised not to even think about it. And it just feels mad that there can be such disparities in 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 the way we approach it. And that's where, yeah, it's really interesting exploring that within yourself and reflecting on like how and why you serve or receive, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, it makes me sort of reflect on why teachers like Ajahn Chah and, and monasteries in general it's important to shake things up sometimes because I think anything that becomes habituated and sort of a bit of a ritual, even receiving alms or, you know, doing the ceremony before lunch, it can become very kind of, oh, yeah, it's this time of day again and doing the same thing again. It's not the same thing. It's a new moment, you know, and there's a certain beauty you can bring to it if you reflect on why you do it. And maybe sometimes, you know, it's important not to do it for a bit. If it has got kind of really stale, and it started to lose some of the meaning then not to do it for a bit or to change your pattern just just do something different for the sake of it just to shake things up um and maybe to get you back in touch with why you chose to do it in the first place I think that can be really helpful as well so this is choice basically I think we have to have a feeling that something's a choice um yeah yeah I've noticed in monasteries anyway, there's a danger, you know, of everything becoming institutionalized and losing that meaning. And I don't know, maybe that's the same for those doing the dishes every day or whatever people do to serve the Sangha, to serve the whole community. Yeah. So I'm going to a couple of comments in the chat. Uh, so I think this one came a bit earlier, but they're saying maybe it is what they ask you to do. In other words, um, whether it's going to benefit you or not, I think, like whether that service is beneficial, e.g. pornography, sex, abuse, betting or drinking. So, God, goodness me, I hope they don't ask you to do all those things, but <laughs> we've got a whole list of really bad things for them to ask us to do, which would certainly be uh, difficult. But, yeah, even if someone asks you to do something supposedly wholesome, how much benefit are you getting unless you do it? willingly and with awareness and wisdom of why. Uh, and I think sometimes also doing it at the right time, you know, even if it's a good thing to do, and you know why you want to do it, you know, it's, you know, wholesome. Maybe it's the wrong time for the other or for you. Maybe you're actually tired and you could do the rest first. I mean, in my role, there's no end of good things I can do. I have to be so careful not to answer every invitation to give a talk or to, you know, to go to a conference or do a video recording if I answered everything with a yes which I do as too much, um, I would be pretty dead. So, yeah, it's quite a subtle thing, isn't it? I also think this is encouraging us to serve, by the way, <laughs> but just to do so in a really beneficial way, because I think on the whole we can uh, get so much from giving. Um, so another comment in the chat. After a car crash... I was left bedbound. It was such a lesson to have people helping me, washing me. Oh, this thing's in the way. Uh, ah, there we go. Sorry. Uh, after a car crash, these little things come up and they disturb me. Ah. Okay. 
After a car crash, I was left bed bound. It was such a lesson to have people helping me, washing me, etc. I'm used to being on the serving side rather than the receiving side, especially at 26. Yeah. Yeah. It must have been very interesting and probably challenging at times, I imagine, to um, have to accept that your body's not capable right now of doing what your mind wants you to do. <laughs> Um, I mean, to a lesser extent, I had an experience where I was in Asia and very sick, actually. And some Thai doctor decided to give me steroids, which actually were worse than the sickness itself, especially trying to get off them. And uh, my adrenaline would suddenly just crash around me just as I started to walk somewhere and I'd have to stop and I'd feel dizzy or sweaty or and uh, it was such a lesson in not being able to override my body the way I used to. You don't even realize you're overriding it most of the time. You just presume that you decide, your mind decides what you want to do and your body just follows like a little, you know, puppy dog. And this time it's like, no, my body's not moving. <laughs> it's going to sit right here and I'm going to have to find the energy to get back up the stairs to my guest room, you know. And uh, it's very humbling, actually. It can be very humbling. The Buddha talked about the conceit of youth and the conceit of health as two kind of things that uh, sometimes mask how fragile we are. And we can't take anything for granted. But hopefully it was a good lesson in the end. I don't know, it'd be nice to hear more. Yeah. Okay, I'll come to Mike, is it Mike? Hi, um, yeah, I was just, I was just gonna say, I think it's, um, having seen both sides, to some extent in terms of um i had long-term unemployment and i was i was actually homeless at one point and you know i'm now doing sort of okay and i think it can be very easy to be sort of smug when you're giving and you've got money and you can go out and buy people coffees and you can pay for the meal and all that sort of thing um but obviously i've seen times when i i couldn't possibly sort of afford to do that and so I just think that, as this person was saying here about the car crash and having to accept being served, I think that's also a very good lesson when you come to giving, because you're understanding what the person receiving is thinking and you know what they're going through. Um, and I think that's quite important, actually, so that you're not one of the one of the benefits of that is that you're less inclined to be, say, patronising yeah. when you're giving somebody something because you understand um, how they are feeling if mm. you've been through that yourself. That's all I wanted to say, really. Beautiful, yeah, beautiful. I mean, that is a gift, isn't it, in that sense, that you have then more empathy for somebody on the receiving end. Yeah, and how that might make the person feel perhaps even small or looked down on, pitied, rather than, you know, received with compassion as an equal. Um, when the tables so, could so easily turn, it's really um, sobering to realise that, you know, er, any person in any condition that we see in the world could be us. We just can't, you know, really separate ourselves from anyone else. Even if something seems far away, like war, you know, we often feel like, oh, well, it's safe over in the UK or wherever else people here are from because obviously we're not in immediate danger for our life but that could change at any time and uh, yeah we might need aid I mean sadly some governments also have that sense of pride not to receive the aid you know I remember when um was it Myanmar was it Myanmar where all those ships were it was I'm pretty sure after the typhoon, it was Thai, uh, late Thai, what was it called? It was a massive typhoon that ripped through Yangon and the surrounding areas in 2008. I was actually there at the time and the winds were enormous, even on the tail end of that typhoon. And, um, oh, well, at least a million people lost their life in the end due to like fields being flooded with salt water. I think it was a couple of hundred thousand actually died in that typhoon but Myanmar's never in the news for very long because it's not economically interesting to the world and there were big ships from all over the world sending aid and the government refused I mean this is a military government they refused to let them in and it was just so devastating so devastating it's a slightly different um 
think it was similar in the tsunami as well in India. I think the government refused to have aid. It was like, we can do without it, you know, we're kind of advanced now. But of course, the people in power have a lot more than your average person in an Indian village who's been hit by a typhoon or a tsunami. Yeah, different, different ways. Okay, I think service is an indispensable basis for a feeling of self-worth. To be able to feel you're contributing something to the world. Having been ill most of my life, sometimes severely, and mostly dependent on others, it's often been very hard to feel I have something to contribute. And it can be difficult and frustrating to have to keep accepting service when unable to return it. Ah, feeling you there. Yeah. Very challenging. I can only imagine, yeah. I can I can resonate somehow, even though I'm not in your situation, but I can really empathize with that. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, what I moved to say from my perspective as not being in your position is just that it is offering another person a gift to be able to contribute. But I know that in your situation, it won't feel that way. And we do want to give, we do want to feel our lives are meaningful and uh, Sadly, society seems to measure that meaning in terms of what we can produce, something measurable, something tangible, something visible, in a sense. And I mean, of course, as a member of our community, I see you every week and you are visible and you do contribute a lot because you're part of this group. Um, but that's not necessarily the kind of thing that people will value or notice. It doesn't make it any less, though. It doesn't make it any less. And I think being vulnerable offering our feelings and, you know, expressing those vulnerabilities is also a huge gift that can enable other people to come close to theirs. It must be a really uh, kind of edge to the practice, you know, to be in a situation which is uncomfortable, gives practice a certain challenge, but also an edge. Because um, I think if we do always stay in our comfort zone, we can feel good, but we don't necessarily grow. You know, and I've seen this happen also in monasteries. I mean, of course, that's what I'm most familiar with, but I've seen how it can be just too easy, too cushy, too easy to just go back to your kuti and have the whole day to meditate and your mind just slips and slides all over the place. And it's like, well, I'm sort of peaceful, <laughs> you know, but then you're not asked to give. You're not really, um, you're not really having the opportunity again to, to share in a meaningful way. And people do become uh, kind of complacent. Yeah. So you followed up by saying it's actually the reason I became interested in practice at all, which is a very powerful reason. It's a very powerful reason, you know, from suffering, we get the confidence that this practice can be a way out, you know, can be a way at first to turn towards that suffering rather than a way. We have no choice. I mean, what can you do in that situation? You know, you can kind of feel sorry and see your mind getting more and more depressed, or you can try to turn towards it with all the courage that takes. Can't always do it, but be willing to open to that vulnerability and that tenderness and actually realize this is actually what we all are eventually. I mean, that's why they call it the conceit of health because eventually we're gonna have to meet our own fragility. We don't know for how long at the end of our lives or before then with chronic conditions or whatever might happen. You know, I met, I saw this amazing documentary. I actually watched something on the plane because it was a long journey. And it was a woman who lost both of her legs. She was an athlete and a model. And in her 20s, she lost both legs because of toxic shock syndrome from a tampon. You know, she lost both her legs, one of them over at least a year before she finally decided it was unviable to use this leg, you know. And I mean, her life has been about serving and trying to campaign. For, so that other women won't be in that situation because women still do lose their lives. And um, yeah, anything can happen to any of us at any time. And I think when you live on that edge, you're less likely in some ways to uh, forget that. Yeah, and it can be a catalyst for practice, but it's important to have community around you and to feel you can contribute in a different way. Um, I mean, how much do we really contribute in our careers anyway? I mean, how much really impact can we have on life, really? Other than being kind. 
you know it's not really what we do but sometimes it's just being receptive being there for another person being genuine being someone trustworthy these are the values the buddha teaches and praises as the true values that we take with us from this life so yeah yeah so someone else is saying my mom found it very hard when she could no longer look after people and had to be looked after but I remember one of her carers said she loved looking after my mom because she was appreciative and easy to look after. So I think she did make a contribution. Yeah, beautiful, yeah. I think one of the difficulties for us as human beings is we don't have the big picture. We only see one life, you know? This is where the idea of rebirth, even the idea, even if you haven't really, it hasn't really kind of caught fire for you, just to imagine that might be the case, you know, <laughs> that the tables are turned and there's many, many phases we go through, then, um, yeah, sometimes it's our turn this time to, to be in this situation, but it will change. Yeah, that's lovely, isn't it? I love how you say she did make a country. That's really lovely, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. We're so much the doer, aren't we? Yeah, we want to really do, we want to make a difference. I mean, that's a danger in my role too, right? Of course, I wanna help women get opportunities to ordain. I want to make communities where every person, no matter their gender or race or sexual orientation, whatever it is, where they can all come, ability, disability. We were talking about that today, you know, that this monastery at least has the Dhamma Hall on the downstairs and there's some quite huge sliding doors that wheelchairs could come through and um, it will be easier actually, at least for the lay guests to, um, to access the space. Um, but yeah, I can only do what I can do. And sometimes if I'm in a rush, I don't do it the right way. <laughs> and then we have to take a step back and say, okay, like what can I do in this moment with the right intention, with the right attitude? and uh, and just trust that at some point it will come together. And it is coming together all the time. I mean, sometimes I do think death reflection is very useful. We have someone with us at the moment who loves to do this every day. And uh, the times I've done it, especially when it's been a real prospect for me, have really been so encouraging in many ways, sobering and scary in a sense, but also very encouraging because I realize if I was to pass away, I could say I'd done my very best, you know, I'd really done something that at least I think has value and other people have said it does for them. And that's good enough. You know, you don't have to change the world. <laughs> Just uh, if you're known as a kind person who did their best, isn't that pretty good? Mm. <laughs> uh, coming to Liz. I think I asked you to unmute. You know, you, you say that, well, I, I've got a disease, a very serious disease, which is killing me slowly at the moment, but uh, ups and downs. And every day I think like that. I've done my best. I can't do anything else. Uh, this is the best I can do. It's got to be good enough. Maybe I need to develop more, for sure, develop more wisdom, more this, more that. But today, with what I have, what I am, that's the best I could do. And uh, But remembering death every day is very, very important. I, I have done that for years and years and years. And uh, when you feel, yeah, will I be alive? tonight to go to bed <laughs> will I be alive when I wake up <laughs> well yes there is a lack of logic there but you know what I mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. or will I wake up dead wake uh, up exactly, yeah. <laughs> then it, it gives you the kick up the backside you sometimes <laughs> need to sit down and read a sutta or say, yeah if I'm dead yeah no no I haven't got the time for that let's let's study let's practice let's go uh, to meditate in the forest uh, and and Ajahn Shah spoke about it a lot I translated the book stillness flowing in French it's a very long book 
And uh, he spoke about that. Now, he was in America, and uh, I can't remember exactly the details, but he was speaking to the lay people who were organizing the retreat and were cooking and so on. And he was saying, because that made me laugh, uh, he said, you've got to think about this three times a day, for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. And <laughs> I know that sounds funny, a bit like taking medicines, but in, in a way, it is a medicine. It's a medicine against a lot of things, the hindrances, selfishness, uh, delusion to a point, because you are faced with this impermanence every day, three times a day, if you follow Ajahn Shah. Uh, <laughs> and I, I personally, uh, meditating on, on death every day helps me a lot. Yeah. Uh, there is well, no complacency, rarely complacency. I'm not saying uh, I'm never complacent, but rarely because I think ah, I could be dead. No, 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 I haven't got the time for that. Let's get on. You know, it's. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. It's, I love this conversation about death. It seems to make everything real. It makes all the sort of things that we worry about the little things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a perspective, doesn't it? Yeah, and um, to know how it works. Well, I realised how much it worked. I had an accident. I was uh, knocked over by a car, and the wheel stopped an inch from my skull. And I could see the wheel coming towards me. And I didn't feel scared. I, I felt actually very calm. And um, and then it, 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 the, the lady who was driving the car brake, and I, uh, well, I couldn't quite get up, but, you know, I knew I was okay. Uh, and she was crying. And uh, I said to her, don't cry. Oh, I could have killed you. I said, yeah, but look, I'm talking to you. I'm not dead. And there was no resentment. There was compassion for her because that poor woman was so shaken. Uh, and I suddenly realized, oh my God, this is due to all this meditation on death. I could face that with a smile. The smile went when I realized my hip was damaged and bruises everywhere and so on, and skin missing here and there. Uh, but there was there was calm and peace in me. And that, I thought that was that was worth being knocked yeah. over by the car. Yeah. Definitely, that was a good day that day. Yeah. You know, I felt quite on a high, actually. Right. Yeah. yeah, gives a lot of confidence. So now you don't need to fear your death because you know that you can face it peacefully. If you can face that kind of situation peacefully, and a lot of people who have near death experiences, you know, that's what they say. They say that you know, once they've had those experiences and they've experienced what it's like to leave the body and they go to this place of peace and and bliss and love and just so much deep relaxation and a feeling of being held, you know, they don't have any fear anymore about death. And it changes the way they live as well. It really changes it. I haven't had it myself, but actually recently, I mean, it's totally not that. It's totally no claim of anything like that. But I did have a dream that felt a bit like that in some meadow with beautiful flowers swaying and the light was like shining on this poppy in a certain beautiful way, like really detailed and all this like deva like music in my dream, you know, just during lunch rest. I haven't had one since. And it was so beautiful. I mean, it actually felt like kind of a heavenly image or a sort of, yeah, not quite leaving the body, but in a way you know, for this time. And sometimes it's weird, but I have those sort of things when I know or when I later find out that someone's sending meta to me. <laughs> no names mentioned, but it's very powerful. And um, it's amazing. It's sort of like uh, sort of leaving this world of the senses and the way we confine ourselves by our senses. And I don't know if this is a nice time to completely go off this subject of the of the sutta, but there is a really wonderful book called After by Bruce Grayson, and I really recommend it. It's one that Ajahn Brahmali recommends as well. And it talks about people's near-death experiences a little bit 
kind of mainstream, kind of best-selling style, but he is a doctor and he has done research, scientific research on these things and developed some kind of um, scientific graph like study you know statistic thing where you um actually determine whether something was a near-death experience by various factors and it's scientifically accepted around the world and it's very interesting to read you know you can almost sense that feeling of being out of your body and floating off to this place which is just so uh, no care in the world <laughs> And almost unanimously, almost, people say they come back and uh, they just don't have that fear anymore. It's really interesting to read these things and uh, even imagine that's possible can put a perspective on life, I think. Yeah, so we still have 15 minutes and I'm wondering if we want to talk more about death or we want to talk more about the sutta or uh, what to do. I'm not seeing comments or questions at the moment, so I might just carry on with the service and see where that takes us. So the last thing we read was that one should not be served because there are this or because there are that. And this is quite radical because here this implies that a Brahmin can indeed serve a Suddha. A Brahmin can serve, and this is radical in India with its filthy caste system. I say the caste system is filthy um they still have this idea of untouchables which is one of the most inhumane things you could brand another human being and you know people literally won't drink from uh if you if an untouchable person they actually don't define themselves that way they're the um one of the lower castes but uh they rebranded themselves as children of god which is very beautiful um they're human beings. They look the same. They breathe the same. They think the same. They feel as deeply as anyone else. And they have as many qualities as anyone else. Um, but still, if they go to a Brahmin's water source, they'll drive that person away, even if that person needs water. Um, so this is really radical because here the Buddha's saying, who said that? You know, who prescribed that? You know, you yourselves created such. Uh, arbitrary uh, distinctions and, and discrimination between human beings but actually anyone can serve anyone and only do so if it develops good qualities in you so if it doesn't develop good qualities in someone to serve someone from a higher caste don't do it either and uh, yeah we look to the uh, to the spiritual qualities it can engender in us so here he's moving on from caste to something else, other things that we try to measure ourselves by as being better than or worse than another. I do not say, Brahmin, that one is better because one is from an aristocratic family, nor do I say one is worse because one is from an aristocratic family. I just have to say that because my dad sometimes really doesn't like the royalty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I can get kind of feeling the same, but I don't think I dislike humans. I just don't like the institution of it, but we still shouldn't look down on those people. They still feel, they still breathe. I do not say that one is better because one is of great beauty, nor do I say that one is worse because one is of great beauty. I do not say one is better because one is of great wealth, nor do I say one is worse because one is of great wealth. For one from an aristocratic family may destroy life, take what is not given, engage in sexual misconduct, speak falsely, speak divisively, speak harshly, gossip, be covetous, have a mind of ill will and hold wrong view. Therefore, I do not say that one is better because one is from an aristocratic family. But also one from an aristocratic family may abstain from destroying life, from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct, from false speech, divisive speech, harsh speech, from idle chatter. And one may be uncovetous, have a benevolent mind and hold right view. Therefore, I do not say that one is worse because one is from an aristocratic family. 
And I think the same would go true for all of the other categories. The Buddha's really bringing this down to the way we live our lives, to our virtue. And I find it interesting that here the Buddha's talking about what we know as the first four precepts. Yeah, the precept of abstaining from destroying life, from taking what is not given, from engaging in sexual misconduct, abstaining from these things. And of course, having right speech. But here, um, this is broken down, not only not lying, but not speaking divisively or harshly or gossiping. That's my, for my higher good acronym. False, for my higher good, false, malicious, harsh and gossip. So that's abstaining from all of those types of wrong speech. And then instead of the alcohol and drugs, which does not mean you should take them, <laughs> but instead of those things, which lead to all of the above, <laughs> lead to us breaking all the other precepts at very best, as well as harming ourselves. The other things he's adding here are that um, one may be covetous or uncovetous, one may have ill will, or one may have a benevolent mind. So these are the first two hindrances here. Yeah, he's talking about the first two hindrances, which are, um, in a sense, defining all of them. You know, when the Buddha uses the first two, then it usually includes the rest, because the rest are sort of outcomes of the first two. But, you know, ill will and greed, or, yeah, covetousness and ill will here, isn't it? So, in a sense, greed um, and ill will underline most of the reason that we break the other precepts. You know, you can't really speak harshly or divisively without a good deal of ill will, right? You can't really have sexual misconduct without a lot of covetousness or also ill will quite often, especially in cases of sexual abuse. There's often hate there. It's not so much the loss. Um, you know, destroying life comes from ill will, right? A total lack of metta at least a lack of metta, it might not be outright rage towards a little insect, but it's certainly a lack of benevolence. And of course, taking what is not given is covetousness. So these are the roots, really, for the others. Of course, delusion would be there, but here he's talking about those two. And the last one, holding right view, that can be the delusion, can't it? Holding right view means having vidya, not avidya. Delusion is avidya. And right view is wisdom. So when we see the noble truths, when we actually have an understanding of non-self at a deep level, and when we understand the laws of cause and effect, then we have right view that breaks through delusion. And again, it becomes pretty much impossible to have thoughts and actions based on ill will and... Uh, and greed. Of course, for a stream winner, those things haven't been completely overcome. But even if they act on those things from time to time, they will realize that they've made a mistake. So it's interesting here, and this is maybe helpful for those of us who aren't able to give in the ways we'd wish, or we aren't able to contribute in society in the ways we might wish, to realize that the things that are really praiseworthy in this world are not having great wealth or beauty or you know, aristocrat status, in other words, influence, power, but they're actually living a really beautiful life and abstaining from harm. This is the most valuable thing we can do in our lives. You know, we can make that into the positives by um, being generous rather than covetous, having benevolence instead of ill will. So, you know, there's no end to how benevolent we can be. If not through action, and I'm sure you still have to relate to others and you can do that through action, but certainly we can have a benevolent mind. We can think thoughts of loving kindness. We can spread thoughts of loving kindness, spread loving kindness itself and work on this right view, develop our wisdom. So then what does family, what does beauty, what does wealth matter? You know, in the Buddha's Sangha, at that time, there were people who were hunchbacks, there were people who were tall, there were people who were short, there were people who were dark, there were people who were fair. <laughs> there were bhikkhunis as well as bhikkhus. There were, you know, really, really young monastics and really elderly ones who went forth in later life. And all of them were regarded with respect for the fact that they went forth. You know, nobody was regarded any less. And the Buddha made a point of when... Um, 
three or was it four it might have been four people came for ordination under him three of them from his own caste which was the Katya caste so kind of aristocrats I think they were kind of like the people working in high sort of office if you like um and also kind of uh here it says something about sword and arrow or arrow and bow or something they were like the army type people I'm not quite sure but it, anyway it was considered quite a high caste and one of them was a barber which is one of the lower castes and they would have purposely ordained the barber first so the others would have to um, pay respects to him and reduce their um, their pride their Sakyan pride so that's very beautiful and here the Buddha continues with this little refrain, which is where we'll end. I do not say, Brahmin, that all are to be served, nor do I say that none are to be served. For if, when serving someone, one's faith, virtue, learning, generosity and wisdom increase in their service, then I say that they should be served. So there you have a really beautiful measure of whether that service is benefiting you, whether your service to a particular person is beneficial. And, you know, again, it might be a matter of time. It might not be beneficial to serve someone maybe who's hurt you very much or who you actually have um, a difficult relationship with at this time. But later on, maybe there are ways you can uh, still extend your goodwill to them. So we serve. And serving can be a difficult word for some, but serving can mean just being generous, being helpful, um, seeing what someone needs, being attentive perhaps, maybe listening, maybe respecting. So many different ways we can help another person. And if by doing that one's faith, virtue, learning, generosity and wisdom increase, then that person should be served. And this is one of the beautiful things I have to say about serving people who are you know, on the spiritual path, whether they're just beginning or they're close to the end, one's faith, virtue, learning, generosity and wisdom increase, and especially one's learning and wisdom increase around, and faith, and all of them, actually, around one who's gone that little bit further on the path, you know, because we can learn the Dhamma from them, we can uh, resonate and refine our virtue you know, around such people because we see the way they respond. And sometimes we learn simply by emulation, simply by seeing another possibility. It's not that you don't want to change. It's just that you don't quite know how or how it would look. But when you see how it would look in another person, it's almost like it becomes realer. It becomes more approachable for us. And I think that's what I find around uh, people who are wise. You know, it's a real privilege uh, that people have when they're able to serve a teacher and I only get that I mean I get that at least a couple of weeks a year most years but um, yeah the monks get that a lot because they do have wiser people or a lot let me say a lot of the enlightened people in the sangha happen to be monks because there are more monks and they've had more opportunities and more chances to practice and there are also lots of wise people in the bikini sangha, but the enlightened ones are less because we're so many fewer. Maybe combined, it's actually more wisdom among us. Who knows, you know, relative to size. But um, it's just a matter of maturity um, in terms of practice opportunities so far. So I would definitely say seek out such people if you can and do what you can to serve. And that means sometimes serving one another. If you're in a leadership role, you're often serving people who might be more in need of support in their path at that time. But I think everyone can still learn a lot from each individual because we're all so different and unique. Um, but in that case, generosity might be the main quality we develop. So there are different ways to do this, very different ways. So I think I better finish here because uh, normally we do say a few words at the end about the upcoming sessions and maybe uh, give some links so you can contribute in whatever way you're able, either by offering dana or by coming to uh, offer food, by um, getting involved with us as volunteers. And I would say also perhaps by exploring monastic life or just by coming to these talks, you know, coming to the events and being part of the spiritual community, being uh, another companion for others on the path. 
So, uh, yeah, I think that's all for me today. And have I read every comment? I'll read out Shirley's last comment. I think keeping precepts is said somewhere to be giving the gift of safety to beings. And it may be said somewhere in the suttas. I've certainly said it myself. It's giving a gift of safety. It's giving a gift of harmlessness. That's for sure. Um, I think it's in the suttas as well, but I wouldn't know quite where. But this is very, very true. <laughs> so thank you all so much for your sincerity, contributions, generosity, just for being good people, good practitioners. And by good, I mean, I don't mean an evaluative word. I just mean living a wholesome life to the very best of your ability. So I think that's all. Shall we unmute ourselves and we can wave goodbye? <laughs> oh, I should say quickly, we have a Saturday morning meta meditation tomorrow, not for those in Washington State, because it will be the middle of the night for you. <laughs> You're so lucky to be in that beautiful part of the world, apart from missing the meta meditation. <laughs> uh, so that's at nine o'clock tomorrow. And I think we'll probably have to come back here for that. So we're kind of getting taxis to and from, which is anyway, just what we have to do. Um, we could try and do it there, but I'm worried about the connection. So we'll see how that goes. And then hopefully by Wednesday, we should be able to Zoom you the meta chanting from the new place and also the next Friday sort of class. So take care, everybody, and have a wonderful week. <laughs>